We're going to continue in uh, History of the Churches and Bibles of the Reformation. And we're continuing with, uh, we have, I think, probably this week and next week, most likely next week, the last one of the English Bible. Or actually would be, that would be actually finish the section on Bibles of the Reformation because we're finishing that section with the English Bible, which is the lengthiest because we speak English. Um, and uh, we've talked about some other ones as well. But we're still uh, going to finish up on the okay nothing's working this morning let's try this <laughs> it's, it's, yeah well battery's not dead all right well I'll just do it the I'll do it the other way I'll do, oh it's that it's not the pointer it's the PowerPoint that's that's having problems I thought it was the, uh, thought it was the clicker, but it is not the clicker. It is the computer. It's time to retire this thing. This is my wife's old one. And I'm in, what's that? Get an overhead projector. Yeah, there you go. You won't have any problem with that. That's right. <laughs> An overhead, oh, oh, overhead, I, I was thinking, no, it's, it's, oh, I've seen it, yes, okay. I've seen them. No, they, uh, those, yeah, they're just 100% oh, reliable, except when the, except when the bulb blows out, so, you know. Little yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, I mean, that is, that is old school. No, I, I grew up seeing overhead projectors and, but, it, but I was thinking, this, this is where my brain is now. I'm thinking overhead projector. It's a projector like that over my head. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what that is, too. I mean, these are overhead. Proje it's projecting over my head or part of my head. But um, yeah. <laughs> now I need to bring in a different laptop here because this one definitely is is uh, needing a retirement. I've just been trying to stretch it so I wouldn't have to bring mine over every week. But uh, let's see if this uh, see if this does it. Ah, there we go. All right. So yeah, those are old. Now the problem with overhead, those old school overhead projectors, is that the uh, transparencies those don't come cheap. Those are you can go through a lot of transparencies, and they are not uh, not. I mean, maybe if you maybe they uh, who knows that they still even make them, but uh, you know you probably want to buy them if you, depending on what kind of uh, of presentation you're doing, you want to maybe buy them in a case of ten thousand or something, you know, to make sure <laughs> you have enough to last you for a long time. So, um, no, I'm thankful for, for uh, technological projectors. Although the overhead, there is something about that old school, you know. There, there is something about it. Um, it's better. Yes. <laughs> well, let's move on. Um, but uh, <clears throat> history of the churches, Bibles of the Reformation, the uh, English Bible, Tyndale. We've been talking about Tyndale's New Testament. Uh, he also translated a portion of the Old Testament. Um, most of the fruit of the labors of Tyndale, and this is picking up right in the middle, but uh, so we finish out Tyndale today. Tyndale did not live to see most of the fruit of his labor because his, his life was cut short. Um, but what was the fruit of his labor? His translation was the basis for several revisions, other translations that, that relied heavily on his translation. Uh, there was the Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, Great Bible, Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, culminating in the King James Bible of 1611. Uh, a large percentage of Tyndale's words remain in the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, there was, and there's probably various studies that have been done that maybe this isn't an exact percentage, but there was one particular study in, of portions of the King James Bible in 1998 that found that 83% of the King James Bible was a match to Tyndale. And so even though there are those other uh, Bibles, Coverdale, which we'll talk about those, Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, they relied heavily on the Tyndale Bible. So when we talk about the significance of Tyndale, we're not just talking about a translation that was used for a time and then not used anymore, but it had influence down through uh, several 
of, of following uh, translations and revisions of the, the English Bible. Uh, a, Tyndale gave English-speaking people a Bible that is not only accurate but also beautiful. And when you look at the language of the King James Bible, most of the language, much of the language, look at the language of the Old Testament, I'm sorry, the New Testament, most of that language would be what Tyndale used. Very, very similar um, and, uh, and in, that, in that time frame. And so it's, it's a very beautiful uh, English, and it's one that really... Someone put it this way, um, you should try to, and, and maybe I'm not getting the um, phrase right, learn up to the King James Bible. So rather than bringing the Bible down to my level, why not, because of the English of the King James Bible, or Tyn Tyndale, let's just say Tyndale, go up try to learn up to that English because the more you actually read it the more familiar you become with it and then some of the language of it is not as much of an issue uh, as far as words and phrases and say well, well we don't use you know some people say well we don't you know we don't use these and thous well we don't use these and thous but they stayed true to the specifics of the plurality or singularity of those pronouns and so, so you get familiar with that, even though I don't, I don't use thee and thou in, in my everyday speech, but when I'm reading the Bible, it's helpful in understanding the Bible better. Uh, so he, it's, it's not just accurate, it's also beautiful. Mo many expressions common to the English language are from Tyndale, such as let there be light, fight the good fight, filthy lucre, eat, drink, and be merry, a prophet has no honor in his own country, ye of little faith, sign of, sign of the times, a man after his own heart, am I my brother's keeper? The powers that be, the salt of the earth. And those are things that are used uh, not just by Christians in, in a biblical sense, but also by many people in the culture, in the language. And I don't know why the flies are so bad today. We walked in the door and there was... They're, they're what? They're sweating. They're sweating. They're trying to find a cool place. But some walked in the door and there were three flies by the window waiting to get out. And so I obliged. I let them get out. Because um, I don't want them in here, but I don't know where they came from because they weren't. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Um, so anyway, hopefully there's no source in here where they're uh, fine. They're what? Trying to get away. Trying to get away from the devil. Yeah. Well, some people say that flies are the demons, but um, yeah. <laughs> but the good thing about flies is that they do feed other creatures like spiders and you know other things. But right now it is of the devil. Um, so, it's entertaining. It's, yeah. so these are expressions that are common to the English language that are from Tyndale. Uh, the Tyndale Bible transformed the nation of England. It was read widely. At least two million were printed in whole or in part between 1525 and 1640, and multitudes of common people were motivated to read it, which then also increased literacy in England. Uh, and so that was better for society as a whole. The Tyndale Bible had a significant role in the creation of the United States. How did that happen? Because of the descendant Bibles, uh, the Bibles that are descendants of Tyndale's Bible. Uh, the Geneva Bible, a descendant of the Tyndale, was brought to America in the 1600s by the first settlers. The King James Bible had an influence on America's unique political founding documents in the 1700s. The first English Bible printed in America was printed by Robert Aiken in 1782, uh, only 11 months after the end of the Revolutionary War. The Bible was recommended by Congress on September 10th of 1782. They said, resolved that the United States in Congress assembled highly approved the pious and laudable undertaking of Mr. Aiken as subservient to the interest of religion, as well as an instance of the progress of arts in this country, this recommend, uh, recommended this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. Now, here was something that was not good that Aikens tried to do. He tried to he petitioned Congress in 1789 for a 14 year patent to print the Bible, but Congress refused. Uh, and so that's a good thing. You don't want the 
printing of the Bible just in the hands of one person. It should be uh, available for the pr others to print as well. Uh, Americans loved the Tyndale Bible, and when we're speaking of the Tyndale Bible, we're also talking about its descendants. Uh, from the 1770s, 1770s to 1850, there were over 1,400 different editions of the Bible, almost all of them King James Version. By the 1860s, the American Bible Society was printing a million Bibles a year. In the mid-1800s, a New Testament from the American Bible Society was six cents, and a whole Bible was 45 cents. And so, in other words, they, they printed it. It was being more mass-produced, and the price of it uh, dropped substantially, uh, so it was much easier to get it into people's hands. Now, moving on to the next one, the Coverdale Bible. Uh, Miles Coverdale uh, lived, is believed to have been born in 1488, died in 1569, was born in York and ordained an Augustinian priest in 1514. He was educated at Cambridge and was converted there through the reading of the scriptures. He fell in love with the Bible and later wrote, Wherever the scripture is known, it reformeth all things. And why? Because it is given by the inspiration of God. Uh, he was influenced uh, by and associated with Robert Barnes, who was martyred for his faith. When Barnes was arrested the first time in 1525, Coverdale helped prepare his defense. In, uh, by 1528, Coverdale left the Augustinians and was preaching against Catholic dogmas, uh, transub such as transubstantiation, worship of images, and confession to priests. Because of his views, Coverdale was exiled three times from England. After King, Henry, uh, after King Henry's death, Coverdale supported the new Protestant religious line and was made Bishop of Exeter in 1551. Now there was a sad, uh, if you want to say, blot on his life and testimony. Uh, he was part of the commission of 1551 that was appointed to punish Anabaptist, quote, heresy. And, uh, and so he, and, and unfortunately, we're, we're talking about the English Bibles, which were primarily, uh, God used, uh, there were uh, Protestants that were used to uh, translate it, to, to propagate it, to increase the availability of the English Bible. But at the same time, someone like Miles Coverdale uh, was still holding to some of those Protestant doctrines that uh, are, are at least a, um, involved in the punishment of Anabaptist heresy in one way, shape, or form. Under the Roman Catholic Mary, Coverdale lost his bishopric and was spared burning by intercession from Denmark, where he then briefly went. During 1555 to 57, he was in uh, Bergsaburn near Strasbourg and thereafter until 1559 it was in, in uh, Switzerland. In 1559 he returned to England and helped consecrate Queen Elizabeth's Archbishop Matthew Parker, yet his Puritanism, strengthened by stays abroad, prevented him from resuming his bishopric of Exeter. The Coverdale Bible first appeared in England in 1536, shortly after Tyndale's death. Uh, it was the first entire printed English Bible. It used Tyndale's New Testament and Old Testament portions. Uh, the rest of the Old Testament was translated from German and Latin by Coverdale. It was intended to be a study Bible. Um, and that is that's something where, uh, some, something for the common person, here's some aids, some things to help you, such as the page layout was clear with summaries at the head of each book and chapter. Coverdale taught his readers some principles of Bible interpretation. He said, but whosoever thou be that readest scripture, now listen to these uh, points here, he says, let the Holy Ghost be thy teacher, and let one text expound another unto thee, so in other words, scripture interpreting scripture, as for such dreams, visions, and dark sentences that be hid from thy understanding, commit them unto God and make no articles of them. In other words, you recognize the secret things belong to the Lord. There are certain things that may not be as clear in the scripture that God did not reveal as clearly there. Just commit them to God and don't just try to make something up about it. Um, but let the plain text be thy guide. 
and the Spirit of God, which is the author thereof, shall lead thee in all truth. And so let the plain text be thy guide. What is that? That's the literal grammatical interpretation of Scripture. The Psalms were newly translated by Coverdale. Coverdale Psalms were included in the 1549 Book of Common Prayer and were read as part of Anglican services until the 1960s. Much of Coverdale's work in the Psalms was carried over to the King James Bible, such as the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork, Psalm 19.1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, Psalm 100, verse 1. Uh, some of the words in the Coverdale Bible were carried over to the King James Bible, such as wine bibber, tender mercies, loving kindness, and saving health. Uh, the Coverdale Bible contained the apocryphal books, which most early English Bibles contained the apocrypha. The difference was that the Protestant ones put the apocrypha in the middle between the Old and New Testaments to indicate that they did not view this as inspired scripture, um, but that was something that was typically done there uh, at that time. And then later on, even the, the first uh, edition of the King James Bible, that was uh, included in the middle, but then later on was just completely removed. Coverdale introduced them with, these books, good reader, which are called Apocrypha, are not judged among the doctors to be of like reputation with the other scripture. In other words, not on the same level as what we have here, the Old and New Testament. The Catholic uh, Bibles put them, they're dispersed throughout uh, in different parts of, of the Bible because they believe it to be just as much uh, scripture as the rest. Uh, next Bible is the Matthews Bible. Uh, the Matthews Bible was published in 1537. Uh, the its title comes from the name Thomas Matthew on the title page, which was the pen name for John Rogers, who lived from 1500 to 1555. It is thought to stand for the Apostles Thomas and Matthew. Uh, Christopher Anderson in Annals of the English Bible tells us that it was Tyndale who influenced Rogers to examine the scriptures which led to his conversion to Christ and his rejection of Roman dogma. Rogers was educated at Cambridge and moved to Antwerp in 1534 while Tyndale was there to become a chaplain to the English merchantman. He arrived the year before Tyndale was arrested Rogers returned to England in 1547. The Matthews Bible is based on Tyndale's New Testament and Old Testament portions, and then also based on uh, a bit of a revision of Coverdale's translation. They don't like to stop because they know what awaits them if they do. We'll see. See what happens. I'm on the warpath here this morning. <laughs> All right. Gave him a warning. All right. Warning shot. Cross the bow. Uh, <clears throat> although, you know, the fact is, you kill one fly, there's always 20 more to take their place, you know. So. Um, <clears throat> Where was I? The, the Bible was intended for serious study. Um, actually, let me just go back. Based on Tyndale's New Testament and Old Testament portions, in some places, such as the opening chapters of Job, he made a fresh translation. Uh, once again, so this Bible was intended for serious study. It had a collection of biblical passages constituting, quote, an exhortation to the study of the Holy Scripture. The initials J.R. appear at the end. It had a summary of Bible doctrine adapted from Jacques Lefebvre's uh, French Bible of 1535. It had an alphabetic concordance to Bible subjects translated from Robert Oliveton's French Bible of 1535. It had more than 2,000 marginal explanatory notes and many cross-references. On February 4th, 1555, John Rogers gave his life for his testimony for Christ. And what a, what a, what a story here. Um, he was put into prison, and he left behind a large family, he, including 10 or 11 children. He had young children at the time, even of his death. His request that his wife be able to visit him was cruelly denied by the authorities. He did not see her or the children until he was 
on his way to the execution at Smithfield, Mrs. Rogers brought the children to the execution to, quote, strengthen him against the ordeal. He refused to recant, and the crowd erupted into a thunderous applause as he went to the flames. He was the first of almost 300 martyrs during Queen Mary's reign. His widow returned with their children to Germany. Alexander McClure wrote, Daniel Rogers, probably the eldest child, lived to be Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to Belgium, Germany, and Denmark. Richard Rogers, the famous Puritan minister of Wethersfield, was, in all probability, another son of the martyr. And if so, then the numerous families in New England which trace their, descendant from, their descent from Richard are descended from the illustrious Bible translator and proto-martyr. Uh, another Bible here, the Great Bible. This is a bit uh, shorter. Uh, the Great Bible, published in 1539, was an edition of the Matthews. So uh, we're not talking about a very substantially different Bible here. Miles Coverdale, uh, actually it was uh, yeah, let me go ahead. Miles Coverdale oversaw the completion and printing of the first Great Bible, but there were several other editions. It was called Great because of its large size. It was published in six volumes, each page measuring 9 by 14 inches. So it was, um, that's a large, you know, bring, it's very, I'm sure it was read. Yeah, I'd, I'd hope so. Um, I don't know what kind of their type they would have had, though. Some of the type they used back then was not the most readable, but, um, but yeah, as far as large pages, pages are plenty big. Now, imagine carrying that into church. I mean, you'd need a, you'd need a whole, just roll a, roll a carry-along suitcase to, uh, uh, to bring that in, or you could have, uh, like, a bag, whatever bag you bring in, the Bibles and whatever that is, the supplies that you have, um, that maybe that would fit those. So, four carriers. the what? And four carriers. Yeah, four. Ca yeah, that's right. Six yeah, um, you need you need those uh, carriers. Maybe use a uh, use use all kinds of things. Carry that. So I'm thankful for the nice compact uh, Bible we have. But that's what they had. That's what they did. That's there were different different types that were printed back then, and and certainly even today there's. Yeah, you wouldn't, I, I, although I've seen it, some, some do, or uh, someone has before, bring in a family Bible. And uh, those are, are heavier to carry. So there are family Bibles that, that lay out on a coffee table or, or somewhere in the house. And, um, and those are not necessarily designed to be carried in the church, although if someone wants to, that's fine. And then we have ones that are like this, more of an average size. And then you might want one that's even more compact if you're taking... Uh, taking it along somewhere. Um, sometimes people just have a New Testament if they just want to be able to witness to some people with verses in the New Testament. So there's all kinds of Bibles even printed today, which is, is very helpful depending on the use of it. Uh, the, the Matthews Bible was not much smaller. That was uh, 9 by 12. I'm not sure if that was six editions. It may very well have been, but or six uh, volumes. The preface contained a statement on the sufficiency and importance of the Bible. It says, Take the books into thine hands, read the whole story, and that thou understandest. Keep it well in memory, that thou understandest not. Read it again and again. Here may all manner of persons, men, women, young, old, learned, unlearned, rich, poor, priests, laymen, lords, ladies, officers, tenants, and mean men, virgins, wives, widows, lawyers, merchants, artificers, husbandmen, and all manner of persons of what estate or condition soever they be, May in this book learn all things, what they ought to believe, what they ought to do, and what they should not do, as well concerning Almighty God as also concerning themselves and all others. What a great statement uh, that it was both the, that the Bible is all sufficient for that, and then also it's very important to have in the hands of everybody, that everybody should, um, you know, no matter what your condition in life, your, your level in life, your state in life, uh, it, uh, it was for them. Copies were placed in all of the churches of England upon royal authority. And the Great Bible also became known as the Chained Bible. And the reason it was called the Chained Bible is that copies were often chained to reading desks that were attached to a pillar in the church in order to discourage theft. And uh, hopefully it wasn't the Christians that were stealing it, but, um, uh, but apparently that was a concern. So, although... Sometimes people, maybe they just are picking it up and reading it, and they're not really maliciously trying to steal it, but hey, I'm going to take this along. You know, I, who knows? I don't, I don't know all the circumstances surrounding that, but 
uh, that was, that was uh, what it was known as. And so that we're going to stop with the Great Bible this week, and we're going to get into the last three next week. So I'm not sure. We'll pr- mostly likely, I'm hoping, be able to make it through the rest of them next week, but I don't want to uh, make that guarantee, but I'll do my best. And, uh, and then we'll actually be heading on, I think, maybe to the last chapter of the book, uh, last section here of this, um, this series uh, that we've, we're going through. And, it, and still get, it gets, gets good, it gets better. Um, talking about the English Bible, talking about, we're going to talk about the Anabaptists some more. And um, so looking forward to that coming up. And, but that's where we're going to stop today.